outside, fat inside, excuse me, thin outside, fat inside. Make sense? Tofi, T-O-F-I, thin outside, fat inside. So what does that mean? How is that possible? How can you be fat on the inside, but thin on the outside? Is that okay? Can you be of normal weight, normal size? Okay, what's good? normal? In quotes, okay. So average value. In other words, look at you. You don't look overweight. You're not obese. You don't look overweight, but you've got fat inside in your visceral area. So where's the what's the inside? It's your visceral. So under the muscle, not just under the skin, like subcutaneous fat. We think of someone's fat, it's like fat under the skin, right? It's billowy, arms, legs, stomach, everywhere, right? Visceral fat is under the muscle, in and around the organs in that cavity underneath the muscle. So there's layers where it can build up from around uh, over the rib page and down to, towards your stomach. Certainly there's fat layers that are under the muscle that tend to push things out. Okay. Even though it's not billowy under the skin, pushes things out and it builds up around the organs, around the liver, pancreas, kidneys, heart. And this visceral fat is very dangerous, much more dangerous than subcutaneous fat. Subcutaneous fat, most fat under the skin. I mean, while we don't like how it looks, it's hormonally, it's not that, um, not that detrimental until it gets to the point of obesity, okay? But visceral fat building up in the visceral and the organs very hormonally uh, triggering, very much what triggers metabolic disease because it affects the organs. The organs are dysfunctioned in their, in their function is a negatively affected liver, again, pancreas, diabetes, heart, kidneys, okay? And this is where we get these um, metabolic diseases like fatty liver, heart disease, type two diabetes, hypertension, high blood pressure and kidney disease. Those are very well, very much uh, related. And they're all related to metabolic disease or insulin resistance getting out of control and building up more and more fat in that visceral area. It's much more of a disease driver than the subcutaneous fat that we all are worried about because it doesn't look good when we take our shirt off, all right? Or in a, in a bathing suit or in, in tight jeans, something like that, right? Uh, so it's not the vanity fat. This is the disease fat. This is the stuff that matters. This is stuff that drives up your triglycerides, that makes your blood glucose numbers go up to your doctors. Like, oh, you're pre-diabetic. We need to put you on a pill or, um, you need, you need to cut back on your sugars, right? Okay. High blood pressure, you need a hypertension pill for hypertension, that kind of stuff, right? To lower your blood pressure. Um, these are the diseases that we, we should be worried about. And the things we need to be worried about, but some people, before they start really filling out, they won't fill it out all over their bodies. They'll go, it'll go right. They really start building it up in their visceral right away. And they'll, why? That's, which is the question of the title, right? What is it? Why does it happen to you? A uh, couple of reasons, dietary, there's a dietary reason, and there's a genetic reason. So genetically speaking, some people just don't put fat on. They have a, what's called a low personal fat threshold, which means they don't put a lot of fat on the, in, on the outside, okay, their fat cells don't duplicate that well. They just kind of hit a maximum level, start dying and hit their maximum level and start spilling out fat from these dying or sick fat cells that goes to the visceral, goes to the organs and starts accumulating there instead of in the subcutaneous area, instead of under the, where it makes us look fat. It's genetic. Some people at 20, you know, um, it's, it's, it, it can depend on now every across all uh let's say back ancestral backgrounds it's possible it happens with everybody it can happen with every uh, central background but it tends to be more prevalent with people from the east with people from asia and india so we see a lot more uh diabetes and metabolic disease going on in asia and india uh at at with, for people with very, you know, thinner frames or with smaller frames or normal weight, as I put before, of normal weight. Um, actually, you know, the diabetes, type two diabetes rate in the US is probably about 13%. Now we have a huge obesity rate, right? We got 35% obese, 70% overweight, about 13, 15% diabetes. India and China have a much lower obesity rate, much lower overweight, but they're probably a 25-ish percent to double the amount of diabetes. 25% of the population has type 2 diabetes. It's an epidemic there. They don't put the fat on, and they also put it on the inside, the visceral fat, and it, and it turns into disease. It's just a genetic generality, but it tends to happen more often than not. Also, Saudi Arabia, same, or, or the um, people of uh, uh, in the Middle East tend to be, certain countries tend to have a high, they have a much higher 
uh, diabetes rate, Qatar, Emirates, Saudi Arabia. Uh, but they'll, but the, here's the diet, dietary reason. They drink a lot of soda there. It's hot. Okay. They don't tend to drink alcohol because of the religion. No alcohol. They want something cold to drink. It feels good because sugar, right? It's pleasurable. So drinking a lot of soda. And of course, in the United States, we drink our share of soda and alcohol. Um, so what we see with, if it's not a genetic phenotype that tends to drive the fat to the visceral area, as opposed to putting it on externally, um, we see it from a lot of fructose. So a lot of soda, soda or sweet tea. You might see someone who's, you know, they don't, they probably don't eat a lot of necessarily food or overeat, but they might have kind of this long, thin frame and this pouch of a belly or just have a thinner frame and a pouch of a belly. It's all the weight is right around the middle. You see a lot of guys like that. With guys, it's often beer, could be beer. Uh, beer t- has a tendency to do that, puts fat on the liver. Doesn't the, 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 um, it drives uric acid up and it tends to put some, the fat gets processed around the liver, the alcohol gets processed in the liver. And then we start building up the fat in the visceral, not so much everywhere else. They don't tend to eat a lot. Uh, these, these people, this type, we see this, they're not overeating food. They're just over consuming beer. The other thing is over consuming soda or sweet tea. So that's fructose from the high fructose corn syrup, the sugar, right? Um, but if they're not overeating, like they just tend to be one of those like soda junkies or sweet tea junkies, then you're going to see the belly, the soda belly, right? The sugar belly, because that fructose gets processed again, like alcohol in the liver, but even more so you can't burn that fructose off in muscles. The glucose part of the sugar you can, but the, but the fructose, not so much. It goes all the liver, turns into fat, the liver, and then starts spilling out everywhere else in the visceral when the, when the liver gets maxed out on its fat consum- uh, consumption or fat uh, ability to hold the fat. Okay. Excuse me. It starts push, p- spilling it out in triglycerides in the visceral area and starts building up in other organs. We start having these problems, but that's when the, the fat starts building up around the belly. It could just be from tea and soda. It's crazy. So what can we do to get rid of visceral fat? Because I mean, one, cut out the sugar, first of all. Um, if this is just your genetic makeup, you're gonna have to do some lifestyle change, okay? Um, you, and this will work for losing subcutaneous fat too, but visceral fat's very hard to lose. You can sometimes lose the fat on the outside, but keep, hang on to that fat around your organs. You wanna get rid of that fat in your organs as quick as possible. Number one thing, maybe so you can guess, cause you know what I love to tell people about, Intermittent fasting, you've got to shrink the amount of time in the day that you eat at least 16 hour fast each day. Um, if you can do it shorter or shorter on certain days, maybe you do an eight hour eating window, like a 12 to eight or 11 to seven eating on some days, maybe it's short, maybe it's six or even one or two hours on some days. Like today I'm doing a 20, I do a dinner to dinner fast once a week. That's me. Now I do other days I do compressed eating windows of 16 hours or 18 hours or it varies. But I have like, you know, where I'm eating in a six or eight hour eating window, fasting for 16 or 18 hours, other days. But I do a dinner to dinner fast once a week. That's just my habit. What I do, one meal, dinner, that's it. Uh, you can have it at lunch if you want. That's fine. But um, try a 24 hour fast once in a while. But it, compress it anyway. Compress it into at least a 16 hour fast, eight hour eating window on a regular basis, and that allows your body to tap into those fat stores and start burning off some of that stored fat. And so that means you're going to compress less eating. You're not going to eat four or five meals in an eight-hour eating window, are you? So one to three meals a day, max, okay? Maximum, that's all you need. One to three meals, like hitting one. If you're compressing a eight, six or eight-hour eating window, you probably get by with two. Or two meals and a small snack if you need to in that eight-hour window. But one to three meals max. Now I would tell you, prioritize animal protein at each meal. You're not going to be eating that often. Okay. You're eating less often. You're eating a smaller eating window. You want the most important, most beneficial nutrient dense, not energy dense, but nutrient dense food you can get, which is going to be an animal protein. So eggs, meat, pork, fish, chicken, whatever, get a mix of those, get some beef, get some fish in there, throw some eggs on top, whole eggs, eat them all. Um, the fat is there with it. It's naturally occurring fat. You don't have to add it, but focus on, make that the center point of every meal is getting an adequate amount of animal protein, minimum 30 grams, shoot for 50 if you can, if you can get it down, depending on your size, your appetite, how often you're eating, you know, 30 grams per meal. 
at least thirty gallons, at least six ounces of some kind of meat, or like six, uh, five or six eggs minimum, or do a mix. You know, four eggs like I do, four eggs and about four or five ounces of meat. That's my lunch many times. So, um, you want to prioritize animal protein, then build out around it. If you like vegetables, you like eating some vegetables, put a little veggie on that side or some fermented veggies. If that's your thing, if it doesn't make you bloated or gassy and all that kind of crazy stuff. Um, if you're going to have a little carb starch with that, make it a small amount, fill up on the animal protein. That's what you want to do. If you want to throw some avocado on the side of that, that's fine. Get a little extra fat. But the main thing is start with animal protein. If you can't finish that, you really shouldn't be eating anything else. Honestly, that should be the main part of your meal, uh, at every meal and reduce, or even better eliminate processed food. Now processed food generally comes in bottle, box, wrapper right? The three main ingredients in all processed food. Some of you probably know what they are already. Polyunsaturated seed oils, right? So cooking oil, so like canola, soy, um, cottonseed oil, uh, corn oil, um, safflower, all those. There's there's eight of them actually. Uh, bran seed, grape seed, um, rice bran, that's what it is, rice bran oil and rape seed, grape seed oil. I'd get rid of them all. But you're gonna look, you're gonna see them in ingredients. Sometimes they're hydrogenated, sometimes they're not. They're fillers, they cause inflammation, they're based on linoleic acid, which is omega-6, which is highly inflammatory. These are not natural oils. We wouldn't have gotten these oils from these foods in, in throughout history. We've only started doing that in the 20th century. So I think 1910-ish, 1900s, we started pulling oils out of these odd seeds and grains and beans. It's not natural. And that's when our sickness really started going on the rise. So eliminate the seed oils, get rid of sugar, reduce sugar as much as possible. So sugar is another ingredient in processed food most of the time. High, high, um, high fructose corn syrup or regular sugar, doesn't matter. Get rid of it. Anything else called sugar. Okay. Um, processed grains. So any grain been thrown in there, it's processed, right? Corn, wheat, soy, the big ones. Um, any kind of rice brand they've thrown in there. Basically, they've taken something that may have been nutritious or even fibrous at one point and it grounded into something that is going to spike your insulin. It's going to cause you to gain weight. You're going to store this. It's so ground up. There's nothing left of the fiber. There's nothing but starch in it because the way they bred it or some kind of, you know, uh, energy dense, right? So it's lots of energy, not much nutrition in this. You don't need these grains for any kind of nutrient, but they're full of energy that you pro they're trying to burn off energy. You don't need to take in more excess energy. Get rid of them. Get rid of the processed stuff. No matter how they process it up, it makes it even more inflammatory and more uh, likely to stick to your body as fat, be stored as fat, let's face it, because they ground it down into nothing. It's going to spike your insulin level, spike your blood sugar. You're going to store it. So get rid of the seed oils, the sugar, the processed grains, which generally makes up processed food, right? And that's 70% of the U.S. diet. I hate to say it on average. Greatly reduce that, stick to whole foods, whole meat, right? If you're going to have veggies or fruit, whole veggies and fruit. Okay. You're really processed stuff. So fasting one to three meals a day, prioritize protein, animal protein, get rid of the processed food, which is the seed oil, sugar, and processed grains. That's how you reduce visceral fat. You do that. You're going to see your triglycerides come down, blood sugar, come down, insulin levels come down, and all your markers are going to look better on your blood work. Your waist is going to shrink. Your pants are going to fit better, or maybe you'll You'll shrink. I don't even have to get new pants, new, smaller, tighter pants. Yeah. So, um, and you're just going to feel better. If that sounds scary to you to intermittent fast, trust me, give it two weeks. You'll, it'll feel natural. You won't be as bloated. Your energy levels will level out and you won't go back. It'll be like a new normal for you. Okay. A good new normal, not like the one we've been living in this year, an actual new normal that you want to hang on to. So, have any questions, post them below. Happy to answer questions. Love questions. Uh, otherwise, I'll talk to you later.